All right. Hi, everyone. We're just going to wait for a minute or so so that people can join us. As everyone is sort of entering the room, I just want to say welcome. You are at, at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. Uh, I'm Didi Kuo, I'm the Associate Director for Research and I thank you for joining us today. The academic year is winding down. We've had um, 27 really excellent talks and uh, we only have three more lined up today, next week, and then the week after. And we're really excited that today Bryn Rosenfeld from Cornell is joining us. Bryn is an assistant professor of government. Her research um, specializes on comparative political behavior, particularly in non-democracies and post-communist countries. Her research won the Juan Linz Prize for Best Dissertation from the American Political Science Association. And she's been published in many top journals, which is how I initially encountered her work. She'll be speaking today about her new book, The Autocratic Middle Class. If you have any questions during the course of her talk, please enter them into the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen. If you're from CDDRL uh, and you are interested in asking your question live, please also indicate that in the Q&A. And we look forward to Bryn's talk. Go ahead and take it away. Didi, thanks so much uh, for a kind introduction. And I'm thrilled uh, at the invitation and the opportunity to be with you today. Thanks so much uh, to all for joining um, for this conversation about uh, my book, The Autocratic Middle Class. So the image on the cover of the book is of a pro-Putin rally. And the flags people are holding say strong Russia, strong president. Well, among the motivations for writing this book uh, was the fact that despite the Russia's fast paced growth of the middle class, this was throughout the 2000s, Russia's political system was becoming more and not less autocratic. From the perspective of a long line of thinking and political science, this was really puzzling. Right? Modernization theory like that of Lipset and its skeptics like Huntington, redistributive theories, those by Asimoglu and Robinson and Bosch, uh, as well as values-based theories of democratization like those of Engelhardt and his co-author uh, Christian Wessel, uh, have all expected the middle class to be a force for democracy. And this is especially the case as, uh, as mobilized transitions um, with large civic protests have become a more common uh, route to democracy. Yet the role of the middle class in democratization as we look across different countries and time periods has varied historically. And this variation remains you know, largely unexplained. Um, we have surprisingly few comparative studies of the concrete preferences and interests of the middle class, and particularly that uh, take advantage of comparative public opinion data to make their case. Okay, so this book um, begins with the observation that authoritarians around the world are uh, thinking strategically about the preferences and the interests of their growing middle classes. Right, so to give you just one example uh, here from Russia, this is the Kremlin strategy 2020. This was a set of strategic development goals that were put forward by the Kremlin back around the time that I started thinking about this book. So here circled in red, just below uh, increasing per capita GDP and the annual growth rate. It's a really important uh, development goals of the regime. And even ahead of raising export volumes was increasing the size of the middle class to more than 50% of the population. Okay, so then it's important to note that the segment of the middle class that has grown most rapidly in Russia and that has fared best, even as Russia's economy has slowed, has been managers and professionals who are employed in the state administration, in state enterprises, and in other parts of the public sector. Okay, so in other words, the part of the Russian middle class that's grown fastest, that's fared best over this period is its state dependent middle class. And Russia is not the only regime that's thinking strategically about its middle class. I spent about a year uh, in the region doing work on this project, and I was in Kazakhstan uh, when the Neurotan party, this is the dominant party, uh, the, the regime party under then President uh, Nursultan Nazarbayev, uh, adopted a new party platform. And you can see here how the party described its key task. It described its key task as the formation of a strong middle class 
and a middle class that would serve as the basis for economic, social, and political stability. So a question at the heart of this book is whether these regimes, as they pursue development that increases the size of the middle class, sowing the seeds of autocracy's demise. And the book's answer is no, that regimes can shape middle class formation through state economic engagement and that the resulting economic dependence of the middle class actually benefits autocrats. And because the character of these state supported middle classes, their preferences and their interests differ from what classical theories uh, of democratization lead us to expect. Okay, so they are less an agent of democratization and more a force for authoritarian stability. So now to preview the, the findings, um, the evidence in the book indeed suggests that state dependency limits middle class support for democracy. It also suggests that this effect is causal, that state dependency has a causal effect on political preferences. That is to say, it's not simply the case that people who are less supportive of democracy tend to find themselves in positions of dependence on the state, but rather that economic dependence on the state actually makes the middle class more hesitant about democracy. The book also shows that uh, state dependency importantly weakens, even undermines uh, democratic protest coalitions, that it makes it harder for pro-democracy civic revolutions to achieve the kind of critical mass that's necessary to their success. Okay, so how does this argument recast our understanding of the potential for mobilized democratic transitions? Well, many of you will recognize the image on this slide. These are post-election protests in Russia back in 2011 and 2012. These were characterized broadly by journalists and scholars alike um, as a democratic revolt of Russia's middle class. Uh, but that view of these protests really distracts from some crucial heterogeneity. These protests attracted a very broad coalition, not just the middle class and not only Democrats. You can see the ideological diversity in these protests as you look down this column of marchers. Right? So whereas in the front, you can see these are some, some of these groups are part of uh, Russia's liberal uh, or democratic um, uh, coalition. As you look farther back, you see the black, yellow, and white flags of Russia's Liberal Democratic Party, which is in fact neither liberal nor democratic, but is uh, a right-wing nationalist party. And behind those flags, you see the red flags of Russia's Communist Party. Right? So these protests were ideologically diverse and were attended by not only Democrats. It's also important to note who wasn't at these protests, who isn't pictured here. And in fact, the fastest growing segment of Russia's middle class, as I'll show you a little bit later on in the talk, was systematically less likely to participate in these protests. So ignoring these cleavages in Russia's middle class, I would argue misses a really important uh, dynamic and bottom-up processes of democratization. Arguably one of the reasons why these protests were not more successful at overturning the fraudulent election result or removing Putin was because the divide within Russia's middle class weaken its potential democratic coalition. So now we care about protest as one way that democratization occurs, sometimes um, through mass mobilization, but I wanna also zoom out and show you some cross-national evidence on the variety of ways in which democratization occurs. Okay, so this uh, is from Tang and Woods. Uh, paper in uh, 2014 on the conditional effect of economic development on democracy. So here they've plotted on the x-axis rising levels of state economic engagement and on the y-axis the effect of development on democracy, essentially. So as you see here with rising levels of state economic engagement, the effect of development on democracy diminishes to zero. Now, the argument that I make in this book provides kind of plausible micro foundational or uh, uh, explanation, an explanation that's grounded in individual level evidence okay, that shows that state economic engagement actually weakens the incentives of the middle class to prefer and to pursue democracy. So now before going any farther, uh, let me tell you how I define the middle class um, in this book. So for me, the middle class um, uh, it, it represents the distinction between highly educated white collar workers and less educated routine and manual laborers. 
Okay, so this um, definition focuses on the key attributes of education and occupation. And in this way, it's distinct from some other views, some other uh, definitions of the middle class that you might have in mind. So it's distinct from a normative view of the middle class as a carrier of democracy or as a source of innovation in society. Um, it is distinct from a view of the middle class as synonymous with the capital owning bourgeoisie or as an exclusively income-based category. Right? This way of thinking about the middle class is uh, closest um, to uh, the middle class of educated professionals in modernization theory and its values-based variants. And it shares with the Collier's work um, on democratization, their, sort of their middle sector, its emphasis on members of a broad range of occupational groups between the working class and economic elites. Okay, so empirically, this group has above median income like the middle class of Ansel and Samuel's elite competition theory. And by the way, like the historical middle class of Great Britain, which is often taken as paradigmatic of the democratizing middle classes. Okay, so now let me briefly uh, outline where I'll go from here in the talk. I'll say a bit more next about the theory of state economic engagement and how it gives rise to an autocratic middle class. Um, I'll situate it within the existing literature and lay out um, uh, the theory's observable implications. I want to spend most of my time today on three types of empirical tests from the book. So I'll begin with a cross-national analysis of political preferences, which shows that some of the intuitions that I've sketched out here with reference to particular cases um, are broadly generalizable across the post-communist non-democracies. But because it's very difficult to make strong causal claims on the basis of cross-national evidence, I'll next um, examine attitudinal change over time um, in order to rule out some obvious competing uh, explanations. And then um, I'll uh, present a third type of evidence um, uh, that has to do with behavior um, and, and protest behavior in particular. In the book, there's additional behavioral evidence on voting, but I'll focus on the protest uh, evidence here. And then finally, I'll conclude with some implications of the evidence and findings um, from the study for uh, debates about development without democratization. Okay, so next I wanna say a little bit more about how the argument in this book addresses uh, gaps in two important bodies of literature. So first, um, in terms of theories of authoritarian resilience, this has been an incredibly productive literature over the last decade. Um, and there've been a number of important studies of uh, the role of co-optation in uh, the survival of autocratic regimes. But most of this work on co-optation focuses on either elites or poor voters. And it also focuses on formal political institutions, uh, representative institutions like parties, legislatures, and elections right, as the sites in which that co-optation takes place. By contrast, my framework in this book focuses on a different set of actors and settings. It uh, attempts to return the middle class to the story of authoritarian resilience. And uh, it focuses uh, our attention on the role of public sector enterprises and organizations also as sites of, this, uh, of co optation. The framework also suggests the need to reconsider two very influential ideas in the comparative study of democracy, um, which have ignored how state economic institutions can shape preferences at the micro level and also the structure of the labor market uh, and how it might affect these processes at the macro level. Okay, so um, the notion that rising educational levels and increased occupational specialization lead to more democratic attitudes and the ability to participate effectively in democratic politics, so skills for democracy, right, is one of the oldest ideas in the comparative study of political behavior. Similarly and relatedly, this notion that development changes the class structure of society and thereby improves the chances for democratization and democratic stability right, is um, one of the, the most uh, uh, influential and oldest uh, ideas um, in the comparative study of democracy. Right? And it has older variants like those of Lipset and modernization theory and newer variants um, in the redistributive theories of um, scholars like Bosch and Asimov and Robinson. But neither the older theories or the newer ones 
can easily accommodate the kind of systematic differences in middle class preferences for democracy that this book shows a rise from an individual's relationship to the state, right? And the kinds of, um, of differences that distinguish the state supported middle class from a middle class that's more economically autonomous. Okay, so my talk today is gonna focus um, at the micro level, um, uh, it is um, in terms of individual attitudes and behaviors, but I'll draw out some implications for these macro level arguments in the conclusion. Okay, so how large is this state dependent group and how politically significant are these constituencies? I wanna make uh, three points here. Okay, so first, um, this group, which includes white collar professionals in state enterprises and banks, in the state administration and in health and education, in other words, in parts of the government budget sector, is very large in the post-communist non-democracies. You can see here public employment as a share of total uh, full-time uh, formal employment uh, in these countries is nearly half. And its share of total middle-class employment is even higher. Right, to nearly seven in 10. Um, now, partly, of course, this is a legacy of communism, right? but this is not uh, unique to the post-communist region. Right? Bloated public sectors um, are also a feature of politics in Latin America, in the Middle East, and in Africa. They right? can often go together uh, with, uh, with autocratic institutions. Right, so Larry Diamond wrote about the impact of state expansion on class formation in Africa, as well, you know, by the way, as um, its pernicious effect on democratization uh, back in the 1990s. Right, these are insights I think, that travel um, to conditions in other regions as well. Now, the second point that I want to make here uh, is that um, if we look at the size of the state sector in the post-communist democracies, right, it's not difficult to see why that state sector middle class in the autocratic post-communist countries might be concerned about a transition to democracy. It's much smaller. Now, the third point is that we know from some very good work by uh, labor market economists in uh, the region that there is um, a public private sector wage gap. In other words, that um, people in the public sector uh, receive formal wages that are less than their counterparts in the private sector. And yet, when we look at household expenditure data, we see that the state seems to be better off than those outside of the state, right? which um, you know, is, is suggestive of the widespread opportunities to earn informal rents on the basis of one's official position, right? well documented, of course, among uh, state bureaucrats and within the state administration, but this is also true within the government budget sector in terms of teachers and doctors. Right? This makes the middle class vulnerable to state pressure. It makes the middle class circumspect about the loss of rents um, with a change in the political system. Okay, so, and to recap um, this argument, um, democratization is fraught with uncertainty. Okay? not a new observation. It most often entails change in the political control of the state and greater attention to the rule of law, which potentially threatens job stability, the ability to earn informal rents, and the advantages of the know-how and networks that are tied to the state. So I assume that um, expectations about future welfare and the cost of democracy support are driving regime preferences. With middle-class behavior then shaped by state patronage and the availability of alternatives. So in other words, when uh, status benefits and rents of the middle class depend on political control of the state, right, the cost of supporting democracy rise. Okay. So I thus expect that state dependency will reduce middle-class demands for democracy, affecting both attitudes and behavior. All right, so let me now turn to the empirical evidence. And uh, the first um, uh, evidence that I'd like to show you um, is from a cross-national uh, analysis of attitudes or political preferences. It suggests that the argument is broadly generalizable across the post-communist non-democracies and that it's uh, uh, consistent with the pattern of preferences that the framework predicts. 
Okay, so to measure democracy support, I'm gonna begin with a very classic item. I begin with a question that asks, with which of the following statements do you agree most? Democracy is preferable to any other political system. But it's of course the case that people understand different things by democracy. And so the best way to measure uh, support for democracy um, as, the, uh, as uh, uh, other scholars uh, have, have written, um, very um, um, uh, um, convincingly is to measure support for democracy without using the word itself. Okay, so I also use a battery on respondents' views um, of the importance of the constituent elements of democracy right, and key democratic institutions. So things like free and fair elections, freedom of speech, the presence of a strong political opposition. Now, Empirically, these measures of democracy support are highly correlated. So I focus here on consistency and coherence across these different items. Um, and for simplicity, I'm gonna present uh, results for a binary measure of democracy support. Um, but I've tried this uh, a bunch of different ways and the patterns are very consistent. Okay, so let me now turn to that first set of results. Okay, and I'll show you some key findings from this multi-country survey data. This is again from the sample of post-communist non-democracies, nine countries in total. Okay, so here on the y-axis, I plot the probability of democracy support. Okay, so the first thing I wanna show you is how existing scholarship has been looking about this, right? middle class versus non-middle class. As you can see here, the middle class is a little bit more supportive of democracy, okay, but not by much. Now, you'll recall that my theory predicts that state engagement will reduce middle-class demands for democracy. And in fact, that's exactly what I find. Right? When we look at the results, not just by class, but also by sector, we see that it's really the private sector middle-class or the non-state middle-class versus everyone else. Right? This state sector middle-class, right? um, as you can see here, is statistically indistinguishable from the working class. It is no more supportive of democracy than the working class. And so if we were to tentatively extrapolate from these findings, we would conclude that growth of the middle class in the public sector won't increase bottom-up pressures for democracy. So now you may be thinking of a variety of, uh, of alternatives that could explain this pattern of preferences. For those of you who know the politics of the region, you may be thinking um, uh, about the possibility that uh, public sector middle class is blaming democracy for the economic dislocation of the 1990s, um, or that it was differentially exposed to communist socialization. You may be thinking um, that what distinguishes the state and private sector um, uh, middle classes are different preferences uh, over redistribution rather than state dependency per se. But you might also be worried um, looking at these uh, cross-national results about a variety of other potential sources of bias, right? Um, so uh, um, that uh, the types of people who choose public sector employment um, and private sector employment might differ from the outset, the problem of self-sorting, um, might be differences in the job tenure of Democrats and non-Democrats or differential attrition, and you might just be concerned about misreporting. Okay, so in the book, I consider each of these um, in turn uh, exploiting natural variation in the data to show that they are very unlikely to explain the pattern of middle-class preferences that I've just shown. Okay, for the sake of time, I won't go into them now, but I'd be happy to talk about any of these in the Q&A. Regardless, it is difficult to make causal claims on the basis of cross-national evidence. Okay, so I want to turn now to a design um, that gives me a stronger basis for making the kind of causal claim that dependence on the state actually reduces support for democracy. Okay, so the second type of evidence that I'll present from the book exploits change over time um, to rule out some of these obvious competing explanations. Um, this uh, evidence is going to come from, uh, from uh, three-wave panel data from the Ukrainian Longitudinal uh, Monitoring Survey. Okay, so what the book's theory suggests and what I'm trying to show usually is that employment affects political preferences, that these relationships of economic dependency affect political preferences. Okay, but it could also be the case that political preferences influence the choice of employment or that some other characteristics, say risk aversion, affects the choice of both. And this would be uh, a problem for identifying the causal effect of state dependency. Okay, so um, 
So the empirical approach that I adopt here is to use this panel survey um, from Ukraine. I'm going to use the differences and differences like design, except that I'm going to trace the very same individuals um, over three survey waves to isolate the effect of state employment on a group of Ukrainian young people who are entering the labor market for the first time. Okay, so um, what I need to demonstrate is that the findings don't merely reflect different types of people in state and private sector employment. Right? In econometric terms, we're going to deal with all observed and unobserved time invariant characteristics, and we're going to rule out um, selection or self-sorting based on political preferences using this research design. Okay, so the analysis focuses on Ukraine um, around the Orange Revolution. Right? The Orange Revolution, of course, began as mass protests against fraud in the 2004 presidential election, and it led to a regime transition that many hoped and was widely seen uh, as a democratic breakthrough. Right? But it was just less than a year before the revolution was in trouble. Um, the party of the defeated candidate in the Orange Revolution, Viktor Yanukovych, won a comeback victory. He became Ukraine's prime minister, right? And that led to several years of democratic retrenchment. Now, one of his bases of support was in the public sector. Okay, so this analysis then focuses on a time when Ukraine, um, Ukraine's uh, uh, democracy was really contested. Its political future was uncertain. This was also a time when different social forces some supportive of democracy and others skeptical about their prospects in a democratic transition were literally clashing in the streets. Okay, so as I show you this next set of results, I want you to think about how the argument can shed light on why it's been so difficult to consolidate democracy in a country like Ukraine. Okay, so again, um, I'm going to plot democracy support on the y-axis, slightly different measure here, but again, it's democracy support, and this time across three different survey waves for individuals who enter the labor market right, between waves two and waves three. And ultimately, these two groups end up with very different levels of economic dependence on the state. Okay, so before I uh, show you the results, I just want to note that with a strong research design like this, we don't need an elaborate statistical setup. Right? It's good that we have three waves of survey data because I can look at pre-employment political preferences or values on the outcome variable for evidence of trending. In other words, what we're looking for is potential violations of the parallel trends assumption that's required by this design. So for example, it would be problematic if state employees were already becoming less democratic. Right. Now, if we look at the data for the first two waves, not only are those who are ultimately state sector employees um, not becoming less democratic already, we can see their views are pretty stable. We have pretreatment equivalence. In other words, before they take up their new employment, right, the views of those who ultimately end up in the state sector and in the private sector, um, their views on democracy are very similar. But now if we look at what happens, once they choose their employment, right, and after um, they establish different levels of dependence on the state, right, you can see that the state sector uh, 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 has much lower support for democracy than the private sector, right? So, um, you know, these results that I've shown you here are even stronger for a group that uh, comes specifically from a working class background, but gains middle class employment through the state. So what should we take from these findings? Right, these findings suggest that rising state dependency right, reduces support for democracy among people with initially similar political preferences. And I think that these results um, uh, do that, demonstrate that quite strikingly. Right, again, why is this significant? Right, well, in Ukraine over this period, you got greater than half of those who gained white collar employment did so through the state. Now, of course, it could be the case that reported attitudes are one thing and that behavior, particularly in the context of a civic revolution is something else, right? That the state middle class may be just as likely to participate in pro-democracy protests if it's given the chance. So the third kind of evidence that I want to present um, from the book which returns to the example of post-election protests in Russia from the beginning of my talk, uh, shows that it's not the case. 
that the book's framework explains both attitudes and behavior. All right, so who mobilized against the Russian regime in 2011, 2012? In this part of the book, and also um, in an article called Reevaluating the Middle Class Protest Paradigm that I published in the American Political Science Review a couple of years back, um, I jointly analyzed surveys of protesters and surveys of the population using some novel techniques that are adapted from, um, uh, from uh, biostatistics and epidemiology. Um, which, um, which shows um, uh, that, uh, that uh, the state middle class was systematically less likely to participate um, in these protests. So as a first cut here, I've just plotted the data descriptively. Okay? So on the x-axis, the share of each group among the population, y-axis here is the share of each group among the protesters. Okay? So groups that are equally represented in the population among protesters would lie right on the red line. Okay? So what you're seeing here is that while the private sector middle class was indeed dramatically overrepresented among the protesters, representatives of the state middle class were about as likely to participate in these protests as had they been chosen at random off the streets of Moscow. So now, um, if we push this a little bit farther and we wanna hold constant some other characteristics that distinguish the state and private sector um, middle classes, we can ask whether state employment actually depressed uh, protest turnout. Okay, so here, a uh, uh, um, risk ratio of one okay, on the dotted line means that the first group was as likely to protest as the second, whereas a risk ratio that's less than one on the left side right, means that the first group was less likely to protest than the second. Okay, so then the way to interpret this result is that of two otherwise similar individuals, right, one who stayed employed, um, the other not, right, that state employed individual was about 40% less likely to take part in these demonstrations. And similarly, a state employed middle-class professional was about 25% less likely to protest than their private sector counterpart. Okay, so you'll notice that here, the state middle-class was more likely to mobilize than working-class state employees. But it's important to remember that heterogeneity we talked about. Right? People join protests for many different reasons, and it's important to ask whether they protested in support of democracy or in support of another non-democratic alternative. Okay, so last, let's look at who protested in support of democratic political forces. And this pattern of results will be familiar to you from the cross-national analysis. Again, on the y-axis, I'm plotting the probability of democracy support. Here, it's measured as uh, participating um, in the democratic uh, protest coalition. All right, so first let's look at the difference between middle class and non-middle class. Again, middle class is a little bit more likely to participate in that pro-democracy protest uh, coalition, but not dramatically so. But if we look at the results by class and by sector, right, again, we see that it's the private sector middle class, those outside the state versus everyone else. And again, the state middle class is as likely to participate uh, in that democratic protest coalition um, as the working class. Okay, so again, to cautiously extrapolate from these findings, um, we might conclude that um, an expanding middle class in the state sector won't in fact increase the relative size of the democratic protest coalition. So let me I'll, uh, summarize where we've been and, uh, and conclude. Right. So um, what I've shown here is that authoritarian state-led economies can affect middle-class formation, reducing middle-class demands for democracy and dividing potential democratic coalitions. I've shown evidence um, that is consistent with the causal interpretation of state dependencies effect on the middle-class, on middle-class attitudes and behaviors. Um, I have um, shown that democratic attitudes are not a good predictor of state employment. Right? In other words, I've ruled out the initial sorting of democratic types. Now, um, in the book, right, um, I've also shown uh, a variety of uh, additional evidence um, against differential attrition and misreporting. And in terms of the mechanisms, right, um, uh, we've seen here in the analysis of Ukraine that attitudes change quickly. Right, consistent with changed material circumstances rather than kind of process of long run ideological indoctrination. Um, 
When the state provides new economic opportunities and social mobility into the middle class through public employment, right, we've seen that preferences over democracy um, uh, change very quickly among those Ukrainian new labor market entrants. And so the book goes on to show additional evidence on mechanisms um, uh, showing that fewer private sector alternatives lead to more of the status quo bias, and also that the effect of state dependence lingers, plausibly because uh, individuals' networks, their know-how, right, are tied up with the regime. Well, finally, drawing out um, some implications for those macro level uh, arguments about the relationship between development and democratization that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. You know, it's interesting to note that um, after World War II, the empirical association between development and democracy, this much vaunted relationship, right, disappears. That was also a period of late, late development when state economic engagement really peaked. Okay, so the argument in this book, um, I would offer, you know, suggests a concrete explanation as to why the social bases of support for democratization are often absent. Um, it provides a concrete micro level mechanism, um, which sheds light on the puzzle of development without democratization. Right, this work also um, underscores that the state middle class can be an important swing group in the autocrats coalition. Right, it suggests that uh, shocks to the state's ability to provide selective benefits to the public sector may lead to an unraveling of that coalition. Right, when the state can't provide um, for the middle class any longer, right, it may spell trouble um, for the autocrat's ability to maintain its winning coalition. Right? But the evidence here also suggests a bit of nuance, right? That, um, that that unraveling of that coalition may not lead to democratization, but rather a cycling of autocratic regimes, that is the replacement of one non-democratic regime with another in light of the low level of support for democracy uh, among these key, uh, key uh, groups within society. Right, the, finally, um, the, this project also I think, provides um, uh, 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 a clear micro level account of why privatization that puts uh, patronage resources out of the autocrat's reach can aid democratization. But again, these findings um, offer a note of caution, right? If we remember, the working class was no more supportive of democracy than the state middle class. Right? So privatization that leads to downward mobility for state professionals, right, that leads to the impoverishment of that state middle class is unlikely to increase bottom-up pressure for democracy. Right? And in fact, that's exactly what happened across the post-communist region in the 1990s. Right? We saw the impoverishment of that communist uh, era middle class as privatization occurred in the transition to democracy. So in other words, for privatization to broaden the social base of support for democracy, it must provide alternatives that create upward mobility and preserve the well-being of the state middle class. Okay, so with that, I'll stop and I'll look forward to your questions and the conversation to follow. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much for that really insightful presentation. So we have a lot of questions already. I might not even get to the one that I had flagged prior to our webinar, but um, the first is from Catherine Stoner, the deputy director of FSI, who says, congratulations. This is a really interesting argument and intuitively helps us understand why Putin's approval rating seems so resilient. But we do know that many in the middle class in Russia have gradually more modernizing attitudes in public opinion data. So do you think maybe it's a little early to see a modernizing or democratizing aspect to the middle class in Russia? We might need to wait another 10 years. Arguably, it was modernization that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it took 74 years. And in that system, everyone was employed by the state sector. Um, and also, she's noting that some of the middle class employment from by the state is from 2006, I'm wondering what more recent numbers say. But basically, the question is, would, would you expect to see different preferences or changes in 15 to 20 years? Great. Thanks so much, um, Catherine. I appreciate the question. Um, so let me begin with sort of the uh, second part of the question, which is, you know, so so the the much of um, the, there was universal state employment in the communist era, right? Um, so uh, so how did that transition uh, occur? And you know, one of the one of the um, one of the things that I, that I want to flag, I think, is is quite interesting, is that the countries um, where um, there was an experimentation with the private market earliest, Hungary, 
Poland, right, going back to the 1960s, where um, the nomenclatura, right, where um, the elements of, of, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the state sector um, and even the communist elites were able to participate in the private market, right? Those were the places where, uh, where communism um, crumbled first um, and which arguably you know, helped to precipitate the collapse of, of communism uh, elsewhere. There is a question, you know, you note that it took, you know, 70 years for these forces um, uh, in, uh, you know, in at least some accounts of forces of modernization to um, call, you know, curtains on the, on the Soviet uh, Union. It, it may be the case that these processes take a longer duration, but one of the things that's interesting to note when we're looking now, we have the ability now to look at public opinion data to see whether there is a latent demand for democracy that is yet sort of unrealized um, in these countries. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, that the evidence that there is that sort of latent or pent up demand for democracy that modernization um, arguments would predict, right, is, uh, is really mixed, um, weak even um, in this case, right? Um, and so we have certainly seen um, a move towards more modernizing um, attitudes among segments of Russia's middle class. And I also, you know, to, to discount entirely, there are public sector professionals who take play, who take part um, in, uh, in um, uh, protest, um, you know, as I highlighted in the case of Russia's 2011-2012 protest, it's just not clear that their commitment is to democracy um, uh, as opposed to sort of renegotiating their contracts, so to speak, with the regime. Um, and so, so, uh, so there are modernizing elements within Russia's middle class. If Russia decides to pursue a path of more economic diversification, I think we would expect um, the, uh, the share of those groups um, and their influence to rise um, as, it, uh, as it is. Um, I think that the, that the, the emphasis um, each time Putin has been reelected, the size of the state administration has grown, right? And also as you, as you wrote about um, back in the early 2000s, right? This has been a consistent pattern and that does not bode well for, um, for a stable transition to democracy. Okay, I'm going to combine questions here from Mike McFall and Karis Templeman, both of whom are noting precisely what you said that in 1989, 91, you know, most of the middle class was dependent on the state, but some countries did become democracies. And Karis says perhaps one interpretation is that middle class dependency on the state isn't about anti-democratic values, but instead pro-regime values in both, you know, they might support a regime in both a democracy and a non-democracy. So have you compared the relationship of middle class values the size of the state and support for democracy in democracies of the region like Slovakia and Czechia versus Russia or Ukraine. Yeah, sure. Let me let's see. I do. I have my I still have my slides up. So let me yeah. um, if I can show you. Um, all right. So um, as you can see here, right, the effect of of state employment um, in the democracies is about what you'd expect. There is no effect of state employment in democracies. The mechanisms that underlie this argument, right, are different in countries that are established democracies, right? You have civil service protections, um, you have uh, merit-based recruitment and promotion, um, you have, um, uh, you have uh, uh, less corruption um, and opportunities you know, to earn informal rents on the basis of your official position, right? Um, so, there is, um, uh, there is not, we do not find in democracies the same sort of um, uh, effect of state employment that we find uh, in the non-democracies. I wanna show you one other um, piece of evidence. Um, see if I can get to it quickly. Um, all right, so if we look at um, support for the status quo, 
Right. If you look at the sort of the first model here, and let me just walk you through it so that you're not um, sort of uh, uh, staring um, at the regression coefficients. Essentially, what the model, what these models are showing, is that um, that that what we're picking up in terms of support for democracy is distinct from support for the status quo, and it's distinct from support for a particular incumbent. Okay, so um, you know, support for the status quo um, in this first model measured as satisfaction with the national economy right, is related to support for democracy. Right, if you're dissatisfied um, with the national economy, right, you're more likely um, to prefer um, uh, in these non-democratic post-communist countries, right, democracy. Right, so uh, so something different. Right, um, and uh, you know, so that sort of speaks to the importance. Right, of these shocks that affect um, uh, the state's ability to um, support its public sector. Okay? But what we don't see here is right, a, a significant um, shrinking of the effect of, uh, of middle class state employment. So, so in other words, the status quo, um, support for the status quo, support for incumbents here, right, measured as trust in the president, right? Um, that doesn't matter much at all. Support for the status quo does, but it matters independently, right? And the dependence of the middle class um, on uh, on the state, right, is an important uh, and separate uh, independent factor. Okay. Um, so as a follow up to that, Lisa Blaze is asking if um, state employment, if state employment is associated with democratic values, even if not support for democracy itself. Are state sector employees, um, middle class employees, more tolerant towards others or willing to participate in political life? Some of the other indicators of democracy that you examine. All right. So, so um, if I understood correctly, DD, just um, if you could clarify. So, it's whether they're supportive of um, or express their broader other values that are associated with democracy, like tolerance. Right. And, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Lisa, thanks. It's a great question. Um, and certainly there are, you know, these important um, uh, debates and within the literature about how best to measure democracy support and some of the, sort of this broader constellation of values, um, right, um, um, that uh, that uh, that are sometimes associated with my call kind of maximalist definitions of democracy support, you know, would be uh, an, 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 an additional and interesting angle to, um, to investigate. In the cross-national Surveys that I used; um, uh, those uh, questions were uh, were not available. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development's Life and Transition Survey focuses on sort of the, the in institutional definition of democracy. That's the one that I adopt in the project, and so um, I don't have uh, evidence um, on the broader constellation of, of, of values that you mentioned, unfortunately. Okay, so we have questions that are similar from Frank Fukuyama, our director and a future postdoc, Itug Sazma who are asking if these patterns translate to other regions of the world, especially those with a post-socialist heritage. So uh, Frank is noting that in Latin America, the state employed middle class has also been potentially more open to authoritarian government with a lot of recent middle class gains there in the state sector. And ITUG is also wondering if um, there's something about the post-socialist world that makes state employment influential in the formation of attitudes towards democracy, something about the legacy of communist regimes, something about international rivalries, um, anything that you could speak to. Sure. Yeah. So, so I see this argument um, as uh, as broadly portable to um, to Latin American cases like Venezuela, um, uh, to um, Iran, think Singapore, right? So this is, uh, I think, um, not just an argument for the post-communist region, and not just an argument about um, about post-socialism. Um, so uh, is there something unique about um, the socialist economy? So I tried to, I tried uh, in the study to um, look very carefully at the role, potential role of, uh, of communist legacies and to distinguish, for example, um, a state sector middle class that was educated under communism from the state sector middle class that was educated after communism, right? And this is, I think, an, an interesting uh, sort of additional um, sort of perspectives that the, that the study uh, offers an interesting set of results. And we find that in both cases, right, um, education has little to no democratizing effect. Um, there that um, the post um, the the post uh, uh, communist uh, state middle class right looks very similar 
terms of its, uh, its low levels of support for democracy to the communist era middle class. Okay. So if we were to worry that, um, that something that, uh, that, that makes this uh, case unique right, was the exposure of the state sector middle class to communist indoctrination, to communist educational experience, that it's really education, right, which is long tradition of education being this key variable um, in thinking about um, the, the origins of democratic values. And if we think it is, it is not the case that um, the uh, Soviet era middle class is distinctive from the post-Soviet era middle class. And so uh, a lot has changed um, in, in, in the educational systems uh, since, which I think gives us some, um, some degree, some greater degree of confidence that these uh, arguments um, would port well. Um, but if education in other regions plays a more uh, traditional role in enlightening um, towards more democratic values, then we might um, we might see a, a different pattern of results. One, sorry, one last thing that I'll mention just about the Latin American cases. You know, in some places, um, uh, state employees um, have been more uh, aligned with movements for democratization. And there, you know, um, I think that one of the one of the keys to understand is, is a regime that is very transient, where there's frequent uh, regime rotation versus uh, a more long-standing um, regime, right? So uh, the middle class, um, you know, faces less threat of being associated with um, sort of the, the preceding regime and being, um, um, you know, uh, losing its, its, its uh, opportunities within life chances in the transition to, to democracy. Um, where there's uh, where there's a more frequent regime rotation and uh, less sort of entrenched relationship between the incumbent and the public sector. Okay. Um, so there's some questions here about the mobilization of state employees politically. Um, some indication that you know not only is there ideological socialization on the part of the regime, but also that in some countries, like our former postdoc Natalia Forat wrote a dissertation about how state employees are actively used in the project of election fraud uh, and grassroots anti-democratic activity. So do you have um, evidence potentially that this is also a dynamic at play, that there are active efforts to politicize from the top the employment of the employees of the state? Yeah, so I, I Natalia's work is terrific, um, and uh, it's it's absolutely you know key to, to showing the sort of relationship that um, the state has with its public sector middle class is using them right um, uh, on electoral commissions, using them to you know organize pro regime. Uh, demonstrations. So, in addition to Natalia's terrific work, of terrific work by my colleague uh, Regina Smith um, and her co-authors um, um, uh, Anton Sobolev and um, and uh, and uh, and Sobolyeva, uh, Irina, and this work right, shows that um, that the state middle class has also been used um, to organize those sort of pro-regime rallies. Right, um, that uh, that that provided a, a, a helpful optic to the Kremlin back around the time of the 2011-2012 um, protests. So this is sort of the way that the that the state relates to its middle classes is an extension, right, of its of its campaign operations, right, um, uh, as uh, as part of the 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 mechanism by which it can um, uh, do electoral fraud. Um, and also mobilize its population. Right? So, so this is in part the answer to the question of, of why a state would invest in, in sort of patronage, directing patronage to its middle class rather than to you know, buying off poor voters who are cheaper. Right? So that state middle class right, actually um, helps it at moments where the regime is quite vulnerable as in moments of protest and sort of organizing those rallies and helps it and during, um, during the electoral cycle to, um, to net a large number of votes through strategies of vote fraud and manipulation. Okay. Um, so it's really fascinating that one of your fine or potential conclusions is that a more robust or diversified private sector could potentially be a source of pro-democracy attitudes. That seems to accord nicely with Leo Ariola's work about private capital financing opposition parties in Africa, 
Um, and also, I guess I have a question about the patterns of oligarchy and economic inequality in contemporary developing countries uh, or you know, middle income developing countries. So sure, there is a lot of evidence in the democratization literature about the middle class, but there's also a lot about the role of inequality, some of which you noted and the role the very wealthy economic elites play in either supporting democratization or in blocking it. Um, and these days, uh, sometimes economic elites can be a source of autonomous resources from the state, i.e. in the case of a robust private sector or liberal market economies. Alternatively, it seems in a lot of the post-communist uh, countries that you investigate, there are oligarchic kleptocratic relationships between economic elites and the state. So they rely on corrupt relationships with politicians uh, in order to access ongoing rents. Um, so it's sort of, there is a private sector or there is a wealthy elite, but they do not operate in the way we would typically think, you know, market liberalization would cause a private sector to operate. So I'm just wondering if you can speak more broadly about patterns of income distribution in these countries. You know, how big is the middle class relative to the uh, highly wealthy um, and how the patterns of wealthy and state uh, business relations might impact broader support for democracy. Sure, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about this. So, you know, the 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 notion that there is privatization, um, which creates, you know, a wealthy elite, creates a middle class um, that, uh, you know, that uh, can have sort of one or two relationships to the state, right? It can produce an economically autonomous um, group, or it can produce a, through kind of crony capitalism, a group that remains sort of closely aligned with the state. And these patterns are essential. And I'm really grateful for the question um, because they're, you know, one of the, one of the nuances that I didn't get to in the talk, but that uh, comes through in the book and particularly uh, in a chapter on Kazakhstan where privatization, sort of formal privatization has been quite uh, extensive. Um, but the state has, in many cases, maintained, you know, controlling stakes, um, uh, even as uh, it, uh, you know, publicly lists uh, uh, companies, it's created state holding companies, um, it's used sort of the, the full range of strategies of kind of contemporary state capitalism to maintain, you know, a somewhat disguised hand um, um, uh, in the economy. Okay, so if we look at, when I look at, at um, the role of um, the state in the strategic sectors, in Kazakhstan, right? and look at the preferences of these groups, Didi, that you're asking about within those sectors, right? you find that they are um, very similar in their preferences to the state middle class. Hmm. Right? So, um, so state dependency okay, is the key, not um, you know, even, even more um, pointedly than, than state employment. Per se, right, um, and uh, and that and that really shows um, again when you look at the strategic sectors um, in Kazakhstan, a place where the state maintains a very close tie um, with uh, formerly private sector uh, entities. Fascinating. Okay, so in the final uh, two minutes, I'll ask a question from our postdoc Nate Grubman that said your Ukraine data at least showed that um, even among the public sector middle class, a majority were supportive of democracy. Um, can that be reconciled with your theory that they have much to lose from democratization? And have you explored why some people in that group seem to support democracy despite their employment position? Yeah, thanks. I so sometimes I get tripped up and I and I apologize, uh, Nate, that this wasn't clearer from the slide. So I mentioned in passing that this was a different measure of democracy support. This wasn't the like as in the first one, the predicted probability of democracy support. So in fact, the scale that you're looking at um, is not indicative of say 80% support democracy. It's a it's a it's a um, five point scale. Um, that uh, ranges from Western style democracy to an unreformed version of the Soviet system. Okay? So, um, so what you're looking at there is uh, a decline in um, the support for democracy from a group of young people consistent with, you know, sort of young people in Ukraine being as a group um, generally quite supportive of democracy. That was the high level of support that you saw among those who entered both private and public sector, you know, in the first two waves. And then that decline pushes them. And it's interesting, they don't prefer the current system, right? So again, it's important not to conflate support for the current system with support for democracy, right? These the, the, the book is, is endeavoring to tease those two things out, and they're not 
uh, they're not more supportive of the current system, they're more supportive of a, of a version of the, the Soviet system, and that's the, what, what you're seeing um, in, in the Ukrainian results. Okay, well, thank you so much, Bryn. This was a fascinating talk. The book is The Autocratic Middle Class, and we are so glad you could join us today. Thank you, everyone in the audience. We'll see you hopefully for the next few weeks as well. And Bryn, have, everybody, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Didi, and thanks so much to all who joined and for your questions. I appreciate it. This is a fun conversation.